to Bedford Speaks. My name is Ilse Lee-Bersina and I will be your surgeon at arms tonight. Please make sure that you have silenced your cell phones so that we hear our speeches and songs without interruptions. God bless America land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. I came to the United States in 2013. I was born and raised in the Republic of Latvia. It is located in the northern part of Eastern Europe. I studied languages and business, and I had a translation business in Latin. When I came here, I thought what to do. One of the things was I wanted to have something to do with speaking and meeting talented people. And I jo joined Toastmasters in 2016. In 2019, I joined this club. A year later, which was seven years after I had come to this country, I became the citizen of the United States. Now let me introduce somebody else who also became the citizen of the United States. Our Toastmaster or host of tonight is Bernie Estevez, a dear friend of mine. Bernie, just like myself, is passionate about Toastmasters, healthy living, and running. He's also passionate about mountain climbing. We climbed a mountain last year together. Bernie is an IT specialist, IT consultant. Let's put our hands together and welcome our host and Toastmaster of tonight, Bernie Estevez. I also like to mention that this event is sponsored by our Toastmaster Club, the Bedford Toastmaster Club, which actually meets right here in this room every Tuesday at 7 30 in the morning. If anybody is interested, you can talk to me afterwards. We're going to kick off the program with the Pledge of Allegiance, so can you please all rise? I do understand that I'm not allowed to smoke while I'm here. And that's why I've given up bringing cigars to speaking engagements. This is actually a kazoo. And I will not play it. I have my own rules about smoking. I never spoke more than one cigar at a time. I never spoke when I'm sleeping. I never fail to spoke when I'm awake. I wake up several times a night, and every time I wake up is another opportunity to smoke. Now I noticed the young lady who introduced open the meeting did a fine job. But nothing was said about fire safety. As director of an accident insurance company in Hartford, fire safety is always paramount in my mind. But I suppose it's I suppose it's obvious enough how we would escape the case of a fire. But that doesn't matter because there's one person in this room who can be counted on in case of any emergency. I refer to myself. A few years ago in Hartford, there was a house fire 
no more than a block from my home. I took action immediately. I lit a cigar and walked toward the seat of the fire. When I arrived, the fire department wasn't there yet. It was a two-story home, consumed in flames. There was a man standing in a second-story window. The flames were right behind him. He cried out for help. He screamed for help. No one did a thing. Everybody stood and watched. Everybody except for me. I called for a rope. When the rope arrived, I threw one end up. And the man caught it. I said, tie it around your waist. He tied it around his waist. And I pulled him down. <laughs> <laughs> The coroner stated <laughs> that the man died with no burn injuries. <laughs> I could only wonder how many of you would have stepped forward <laughs> to help that man. I assume I'm the only one. We now come to the main event of our program tonight. Scott Thomas is our keynote speaker. The title of his presentation is The Battle of Iwo Jima in Perfect Greatness. The story of Iwo Jima has additional meaning this week. On Wednesday, June 29th, the last surviving Medal of Honor winner from World War II Herschel Woody Williams died at age 98. Scott Thomas is a prior service Marine. He says that there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. Once a Marine, you will always be a Marine. He will be sharing some of those stories with us tonight, discussing the imperfections present at Iwo Jima, how it reflects on our nation, and his thoughts on how we may want to view the imperfection in our country's history. The stories of nearly all of the over 70,000 men who fought at Iwo Jima are stories of imperfect greatness. Imperfection does not diminish greatness. Imperfection does not diminish greatness. Imperfection and greatness side by side have been a part of our country's history since its inception. If you think back to when this country was birthed, at the time, the idea that a people could be self-governing, that a state could be set up where the government gets its rights from the people, where the government exists to be accountable and serve the people. Compared to what else was going on at the time, it was the perfect system. It was perfect. Okay, perfect might be a bit of a stretch. It was perfect unless your skin wasn't quite as pale as mine is. Or if you were a woman. Other than that, it was still not perfect. But, but, for the time, it was a huge step forward. And it laid a foundation that we could continue to build on. When you think of Iwo Jima, if you're like most people, what comes to mind is that image. Photo taken by <coughs> Joe Rosenthal, published in the United States and around the world, in Sunday papers a mere two days after it was taken. Unheard of at the time. It's an iconic image that galvanized the nation and our allies around the world around the fight in the Pacific. It sold a whole lot of war bonds. 
which if that sounds like I'm casting aspersion, I'm not. They had to do that to pay for what we needed to go to war at that time. Just look at it. It is the perfect image with, with the perfect narrative, right? Just think about it. Six Marines and sailors from all over the country, all walks of life, climbing the mountain under fire, all reaching up to put their hands on that pole to raise that flag, that symbol of American might, culminating a bloody victory won. It is the perfect narrative for the perfect image. It is greatness. It's a perfect greatness, at least the narrative. There are a few holes in that narrative. To begin with, Marines weren't under fire. At that point, the Japanese still on Mount Suribachi tended to hide in caves and the tunnels during the day. As when we saw them, we would drop quarters on their heads and they didn't like them. We didn't know who was in the picture for a while. At first, we got three right, we think. The final revision was made in 2019. We'll see how long that holds. Most significantly, from my perspective, this is not a photo of the first flag that went up on Iwo Jima. It's not the photo of the first time the flag was raised on Iwo Jima. This is the most widely circulated photo of the first time we raised the American flag on Mount Suribachi. It was a few, hour, a few hours earlier than this photo. I would love to be able to tell you the narrative of why we raised the second flag. It was grandiose and beautiful. In fact, the narrative I remember hearing as a young Marine was, we had to put a second flag up. The men still out on ships off the coast of Iwo Jima, that flag's too small. They can't see it. We need something out there that motivate everybody. That sounds great. It's also not true. The reality is really much more in line with, frankly, what I expect from my beloved Marine Corps. The battalion commander who sent the first flag raising patrol up with their battalion flag after it was raised, had an epiphany. He realized that somebody would want that flag to hang it in their office. Ironically, at about the same time he was realizing this, the Secretary of the Navy arrived on the beach, looked up and said, I want that as a souvenir. <laughs> this battalion commander, where the, the younger folks in the audience, can you cover your ears, please, because I'm going to quote from Raymond Combat Zone. He is quoted as saying, some son of a bitch is going to want that flag He's not going to get it. That's our flag. Better get another one, take it up there, and bring ours back. As the runner was leaving, the individual he was sending out to find another flag, put another patrol together to go up. As he was leaving the area, the commander yelled out, and make it a big one. It was a complete afterthought. It was not some grand gesture to make sure everyone could partake in the victory. It was a Marine Corps statement of, that's our flag. You can't have it, sir. If that's not the most Marine Corps thing I can think of in that moment, I don't know what the correct response would be. All of that being said, though, does any of that diminish the greatness of that image? Does it take away any of its power, any of its meaning? It didn't in its own time, and it doesn't now. I still get chills when I see that image. 